Hey, my name is JC and welcome to the Pro Talk podcast presented by House Call Pro, the software that tens of thousands of home service professionals use all across the country to run their businesses. In this episode, you're going to be meeting Mark Mazgan of Mazgan Air Conditioning and Heating Repair in Brooklyn, New York. Mark's going to be sharing his unique experience on how he got his business started, as well as share some tools and things that he's learned along the way to help grow his business. We hope that this podcast episode is not only informative and helpful, but something that can provide you hope during this challenging time that we're facing as a country. Thanks so much for tuning in. Enjoy. All right. Well, we have our friend Mark Mazgan out of Brooklyn, New York. He is, interestingly enough, the manager of Mazgan Air Conditioning and Heating Repair in Brooklyn, New York. His mother is the owner of it, but he runs this company as if he owns it. And so yes. we're going to learn a little bit about him today, uh, how his company is adjusting amidst the, um, the interesting, extraordinary times that we're living uh, with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, this guy's going to be a fun guy to listen to. And so we're going to just jump right in. Mark, first of all, tell us how you became the manager who is running this thing as if you were the owner uh, of your company. We have to start there. So tell me well, how that first happened. Thing, first thing is I need a job. That's the first thing. Uh, this is a long story, I guess. You'll cut me off if I need to be cut off. I grew up doing, prior to this work, doing mortgages. And as I did mortgages, I felt uncomfortable telling all the banks a lot of stories that were made up. Because as a mortgage person, when a customer comes to you, not to a bank, they need help and they can't get approved. And you got to do things to make things work. You got to pay the beautiful picture, the gorgeous picture. Mm. And it's not so comfortable to draw pictures every day that, you know. So I wanted to get out of this business. And I saw a lot of people building houses and selling houses and making a lot of money. And I told my dad, dad, let's stop buying houses. So back in the day, like in all those movies, um, you see these courthouse steps and they're selling houses and people making money. Well, guess what? I did that. We used to go downtown Brooklyn, Adam Street. Um, there used to be four or five people bidding on a house, not a whole auditorium of people. And the auctions were at different times, at different hours. And it was amazing. You can just buy a house for like 200 grand, 100 grand, and uh, 50 grand. I don't know. It was and there was very little competition. It was the same people all the time and different hours. So we started buying houses. Everything was beautiful. We bought a lot of houses. At one point, we had up to 20 houses. Unfortunately, uh, you know, time passes by. And in 2007, the housing market crashed. In 2007 or 8, my dad passed away. And all the loans that we had were now recalled because of TARP loans. And my dad, because he passed away, was no longer able to develop that relationship again because he was gone. My dad would go to the bank, give the guy two kisses on the cheek. The guy would say, come back tomorrow. He has a million dollars. He has $2 million. When a million and $2 million was like probably four or five or $10 million a day. It was very easy. And everything everything in my life just went down to zero. Um, we had a property that was millions and millions and millions of dollars that was sold for... Uh, 70, 80% less, all the equity was gone. And um, I had to get a job because nothing to do. My dad's estate got so sued. It was a very, very hairy time. And um, when we were building the houses, one of my employees wasn't uh, an office kind of guy and he wanted somebody to help him. And interestingly enough, in New York City, the public schools used to take about 10 years to build, 10 years, okay, because all the bureaucracy. So somehow New York City realized that they're doing something wrong and they're better off having everything subbed out. Hmm. So what New York City does is they sub out the whole building to different people and everyone has to get a, everyone has to bid. The more people bid, the lower the price. So they would train people, school construction authority would train people to bid and to do paperwork, and to deal with the city. And so what, ha what happened is, if you underbid on the project, you've got to do the project because you bid on it, and you're bonded. 
So as we're going through that process, we went through two rounds. And meanwhile, this is like eight, nine months already. I'm not making a dollar. And the last bid we lost because I did not submit a piece of paper saying that Mr. John is going to be the contractor for plumbing on this job. And because of that, I lost the job. And I remember as I'm doing the bids, and again, I did construction for, I was doing the managing construction for, let's say, eight years. Um, I like I like the field. And I saw the money that we were bidding on things. And I said, you know what? If I was an electrician in New York City, I'd have to work for somebody for seven years, same as plumber. But for HVAC, I just have to get a license, licensed contractor, pass my 608, I'm there. So within a week, I did my research. I found a school that was um, basically a two-month program, two-and-a-half-month program, and I can do HVAC. And I went to a school in Long Island and drove every day. I had a beautiful Lexus LS430, like a seven eighty thousand dollars car nice that my dad car. left me. It was a nice car. My dad left me a beautiful car. Like I said, when my dad passed away, it all went away. I had that as a as a car, as a vehicle. That's the only vehicle I could afford because it was free. <laughs> well, let me let me stop you there real quick, Mark, yeah. and just kind of get a, a a clear understanding of the timeline. How how old were you? when all that stuff was happening and what was life like? Did you have a family at the time? I mean, I just could only imagine the amount of stress and yes. really sadness that you had experienced during that time. It was really rough. I was probably 38 and it was two years of trying to help my family as a state. I wasn't making any income. My kids got kicked out of school. My wife was in depression. It was very, very rough. I wasn't making money doing this volunteer work, so to speak, to get this job, working and, with the school construction. And sorry, and by way by way of you saying that your kids got kicked out of school, it wasn't for anything that they did. It was just more of the, no. you guys were set it up. It was a private, right? yeah. private school, and we couldn't afford it. There was no money. It was just really, really dark. I mean, whew, I used to drink alcohol to make phone calls to the banks to be calm, knowing it was a vice just to stay calm. To able to deal with the stress that I was dealing with. It wasn't like I drank all day, all night, or drink, or I don't drink, but there was so much stress. And I'm a, like a history buff. I know, like, uh, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy used to drink a lot when he had all the stress, giving the mission crisis, missile crisis, and all these other big people. They do something to relieve it. And that would, that's what I was doing, not to uh, promote it. But um, it was very, very rough. And I saw the opportunity with this gentleman to work with the schools, so I took it. And my whole, every day I woke up was black. I woke up black. I saw only black. There was nothing positive. And when I saw the school opportunity, I saw some kind of tunnel. And I can literally see a little light. Like, I am buried in, in just bed. You know, everything, nothing. And... <sighs> It was very tough. I wish I could give you a digital tissue, my man. <laughs> but, you, you know, I did want to encourage you. At, you're it doing very, great. very, very tough. Yeah. It was very tough. And um, when I went to school, I took it very seriously. I took it very, very seriously. I drove my Lexus, beautiful car with no money. I went there every day. And um, I had a great professor, Professor Malik, and he cared about his class. The class was interesting because most of the kids were actually like off of drugs and this government gave them like, you know, free, free school and I had to pay for it. And the guy gave me a break to start. The school did. And um, <clears throat> I would, you know, I'm a natural salesman because I did mortgages, did it for 10 years. I did construction, but I was a natural salesman. So as I was in the school, I would ask friends, hey, you need any help? You need any help? I had one friend that had like eight stores, commercial stores. And I would go there and fix things. I would go back to school the next day. I said, Professor Malik, I was here yesterday. I had a problem. What do I do? And he would tell me. He would explain to me. We would go over things. He gave me hours upon hours of extra time a week. You know, if he stayed with me 45 minutes, two hours after class, no problem. 
So I cherished the school. I took it very, very seriously. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I interview people a lot. I'm already business eight years or doing this eight years. Um, I deal with people all the time, new employees all the time. And unfortunately, I find that people who went to school got very little out of it, didn't pay attention or didn't really grasp it. And maybe I was lucky because a lot of schools are two and three years long. Mine was straight to the point. Two, three, two and a half months, three months, boom, done. The professor cared about me. He cared about the other students too. He gave me his love, he gave me his affection, he answered my questions. And I was doing jobs <clears throat> for my family, for my friends, for everybody. And um, growing. When I finished school, I got a job immediately. <clears throat> there was no, there was no um, delay. Um, one second. <clears throat> when I finished school, there was no delay. I got a job. And my first job, I was the guy put me in the office. I'm like, I want to go work. Like, put me in the office. So. He was sending out microwaves to be fixed. And I go to him, why are you sending them out for? Why don't you fix them yourself? He goes, oh, we have nobody to fix it. I said, sir, I can fix it. I went online. I bought a book. I started reading. I opened the thing up. I fixed my first one. Like in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the guy's like, oh, you fixed microwaves? I said, sure. It's all about electric. And my school taught me electric and taught me air conditioning. I was there for about two, three months. And I was just stuck in the office and fixing microwaves. And I did not like fixing microwaves because I got hit with microwaves, you know, the blast, so to speak, like you feel like, you're, like your head is like, <clears throat> like you're drunk or something, or lightheaded, and your neck feels soft. And it's not good. Wow. So <clears throat> I didn't like it. It's very, very high voltage. You have thousands of volts on from transformer. Transformer is like, I don't know, 20 pounds. It's huge. Yeah. We had, we did uh, all these big restaurants. They had three magnetrons in each microwave. So one minute in your house would be like, or really three minutes in your house is one minute in their microwave. It's fast and powerful. So I did that. And I went to another job, told them I'm a self-starter. And there too, also for restaurants, I worked on one machine, one machine only. And all I did was drive like an Uber driver. And I, I went to school to, to do things, not to drive and drive and drive. And um, it was, it wasn't what I expected. I told the guy, I want to do different things, not microwaves, different things and learn. And I, 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 ma I mastered the machine, but the owner was not interested in me doing other things and the staff there was very unhappy with their jobs it was all about job security and not sharing your knowledge with somebody else so as i told you i was very good in school in ac school and i had a friend of mine that i helped him pass the 608 test so not that he owed me but i called him up i said listen i need to work can i just hang out with you so I volunteered for a couple of days, maybe maybe three days, four days. He's like, I can't, you can't volunteer. You have to get paid. So he paid me. That summer I worked with him and I'm watching what he does. And I'm like, whoa, this is not what school does. We don't do like this in school. And I'm like, this guy's not doing it the right way. And I know what I learned in school was right. I understood the theory of what I was doing. I wasn't doing anything mechanical. Everything was done in a professional, proper way. And... And he wasn't doing it that way. He did a lot of shortcuts. I saw the shortcuts. Okay. But I wouldn't do it. And then I worked with another guy that he knew that I met him at a job too. And I worked with him and he wasn't honest. And I didn't want to be associated with somebody that's dishonest. So mm. I spoke to my mom. I said, mom, we're going to open up a company. And basically that's what we did because I had no funds. So my first car was still the same car, my still my Lexus. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget this. <clears throat> John Sold Supply in Brooklyn, which is still my supplier right now. The owner is my, I love the owner. I love the owner's children and the staff that's there, that was there and that is there. And their first manager and the first people, that, when they first got to know me, they weren't really loving me <laughs> because I asked a lot of questions because I want to know the way to do it properly. I want to know what this does and what that does. I don't want to make mistakes on account of my customer. I want to know what I'm doing. And they didn't like it. Mm. And there was this machine, like this old unit that was really, really cheap. It was brand new. And it was on sale. So I said, let me buy it. So I put it on top of my roof of my Lexus. 
and it was drizzling outside. And the guy's like, you're not going to return this. I'm like, what are you talking about? He takes a photo of my car with the condenser <laughs> evaporate on my roof. And he puts it in his, he puts it in his office, hangs it up like this guy cannot return the machine. I'm like, oh, my God. And that was my first car. Okay? Wow. My first car was a Lexus LS430 with a B tank in it, everything in it. Well, who knew, who knew that it pegs. was a, who knew it was so utility, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I put, I've gone to New York City from Brooklyn with Fujitsu units on the roof, driving. Whatever it takes. Bridge. Forget about it. Whatever it takes. No problem. Uh, yeah. My second car, my uncle donated to me. It was an old, like, uh, phone company truck, you know, that has that boom to go to, the, like, the telephone poles. Right. And if you notice how those trucks are designed, the back is, like, long, and there's, like, and that bucket actually goes in the back and there's this whole mechanism this whole arm in the center that holds picks it up my uncle dismantled that and put it into another vehicle so when i got the van i had this huge open roof (laughs) it wasn't a skylight it wasn't a moonlight it was like no (laughs) just a convertible (laughs) the best (laughs) and to start the car oh my god you go for like a minute and i was like boom and my first employee was a mechanic. So he changed all the spark plugs, changed the muffler. I mean, the car was amazing. It was, and it worked. And after one of my first few jobs, I went to my duck guy. I was like, listen, I need some sheet metal to cover my roof. So if you saw my car, it was a blue van with a white, with a, with a stainless steel top, with foam coming out of the sides. It was crazy. Wow. So that was the first winter. That winter, uh, it was cold. <laughs> I had the heat on and the, and the roof open. And then finally, so, spring comes. I'm like, okay, let's get the air conditioner to work. I go to the mechanic. I'm like, sir, could you I, could you help me with the air conditioner? You know, I don't do car air conditioners. It's a different license, a different job, different everything. He opens up the, the hood. And all of a sudden, he gives me a double take. I said, like, what happened? He's like, what, what do you mean what happened? He goes, you have no compressor. I said, what? I said, oh, my God. There was two alternators, no compressor. Oh, so I had wow. no air conditioner. <laughs> You're like, what do you want me to fix here? <laughs> exactly. So, so I know air conditioning my first, my first van, but so, uh, so these are obviously humble, be- humble beginnings. At, yes. At yes, what yes. age did you decide to start? I went business? to school at forty, at age of forty-two. I went to school. Wow. And I'm fifth. I'm going to be fifty next month, God willing. Man. And 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 so your mom, you you went to your mom. You said, "I'm going to I'm going to start this business." Yes. And so, um. I mean, maybe I'm asking this prematurely because maybe sure. you'll, you'll get to this, but why have her be the owner if you are the one that is running this company? My credit before my father passed away, it got hurt from stuff with him. Mm-hmm. And those three, four years were really bad. And uh, it just couldn't do anything. I mean, thank God the company is self-sufficient. We don't ask for handouts. Thank God we never really ask for handouts from mom. Uh, she does sign on on like cars and stuff like that. That van, my first van is paid off, thank God. We have two other vans, you know, and we're paying it off little by little. And everything is fine. There's no problems. We have money in the bank. Uh, even though we have this disaster, which we'll maybe go into later with uh, the virus, uh, everything is fine. But we needed her to start it off. Otherwise, I wouldn't. Even the, even to get a credit line from the, from the uh, distributors, you can't go with like, nasty credit wow they won't give it to you so i had to do that yeah i mean and, uh, i mean yeah. thank you for sharing that i mean man, sure uh the determination within you i mean i want to point this out that is huge i know you just kind of went went you've kind of flew through like flew by that very tragic difficult time um but man kudos to you for not just laying down and going forget about it i forget it i'm done my, my mom also is very motivational to me mm-hmm. my dad was a role model as far as behavior as far as personality you know what he built before he passed away was immense but you know nobody has control of the economy my dad was very charismatic but my mom really pushed me never to give up and um she knows that's my personality and so she'll help me give me a little push you know what i'm saying yeah. She knows that she doesn't have to carry me, just has to give me a little push. 
Yeah. And uh, I'm very self-motivated. I'm very self-motivated. And um, also, I love what I do. I mean, there's another thing, another short story to this whole thing is I realize recently as being almost 50 years old and having a two-year-old son and kids that my parents used to throw me to my grandparents to like get away. And my grandfather, who thank God is still, he's 99 years old. Wow. He grew up also through very hard times. I mean, very hard times, uh, Holocaust and family dying and no money. And he lived because he was a tradesman. He built uh, shoots of stainless steel in uh, Uzbekistan in order to have food. He's Polish. In order to have food, he actually built plants for flour. And he had he had his means. And he was able to survive because he was very, he had ingenuities, you know. He left uh, after the war. He, he ended up in Israel. And over there, which is very, very cool, he actually built solar water heaters wow. in the 1950s. And he made a lot of money doing it. And the Israeli government is not like America. In America, you don't pay taxes for three years. Nobody even knows you exist. In Israel, they come to your, to your store and people talk about you. Oh, you have a lot of money. You have a new car. You have a motorcycle. And so they were checking him out, harassing him. And he's like, oh, just leave me alone. And so he left. He went to America, came to Brooklyn. And uh, he built, found out, he went around looking what, what's interesting to do in, in America because he's a handy kind of guy, trades kind of guy. And he started building restaurant equipment. And I remember at the age of five being in the Bowery, New York, which Bowery is a very big street in New York, very popular for restaurant equipment. My dad, my grandfather used to build restaurant equipment. I remember as a five-year-old, I used to take copper in my hand, a copper cutter. I used to cut copper. I used to switch copper. I used to play with the stuff, not knowing that I'll do this like 30 years later. Right, or right. 40 years later. Um, my grandfather used to braise with uh, oxygen acetylene. Uh, he used to solder. He used to build machines from scratch. He bought a compressor and everything else. He did. He built his own condensers, his own evaporators. He did everything himself. And that was my fifth, my uh, age of five, six, seven, eight. My parents would throw me to Florida, not realizing they threw me there. <laughs> oh, vacation, yeah, but not with them. Just with my son, my with my sister. We we'll go to his place in Florida. He he built it still. And when my dad passed away, I said to myself, you know what? I think I'm gonna go my my grandfather's way. And so I left that whole real estate and all that other stuff and did something that's more modest, so to speak, uh, more um, fulfilling. And uh, I love I love what I do. Yeah. I love what I do. That's a beautiful and so, story. So it's kind of like in me because my grandfather did all this stuff. I do air conditioning. I do heat. Uh, as far as heat's concerned, I do boilers, steam boilers, and I do water heaters. And uh, the water heater parts, the Navion water heaters, the tankless ones, that saves my life in the winter because everyone could do, a lot of people could do heat. It's not like, uh, it's not in New York, we have old housing. So you have steam heat that's from the 1900s, 1920s, and before. It's not such a complicated system. I know it very well on a high level. I did a lot of reading. I read books about it. I got the seminars about it. I paid for seminars to go to. Uh, regular heat. I actually went to a class for a week to go for a week. Uh, went to Viega School in uh, New, New Hampshire. I went there for a week, and when I was there, I before I went there, I was reading these books. I couldn't get it. I was like, "What's going on here? I don't see this in Brooklyn." So I go to the instructor. I said, "Sir," I said, "You know, I here's your book, and I got the same thing. You know, I'm reading the same stuff you're showing me in class, and here's pictures of Brooklyn." You know, what he do, you know what he goes to me? You know what he tells me? What? He goes, oh, you're in Brooklyn. Everything's opposite over here. Everything's wow. Oh, okay. I got it. <laughs> you know, in Brooklyn, everyone copies the other guy. So one guy copies the other guy, copies the other guy, copies the other guy, copies the other guy, who copies the other guy, who copies, who doesn't know anything, who guesses. So mm -hmm. everyone guessed from the first guy. And nobody learned. And I have an advantage, so to speak, because I want to learn and because I want to invest my time in learning because I want to read the books. I want to go to the seminars. I want to go to the online classes, the personal classes to make myself prof professional, proficient, the best that I could be. 
not the best around me, but the best that I could be so that I reach my potential and reach my level. So I'm still learning. I'm on classes right now with this COVID, you know, this uh, coronavirus. I'm learning on, online. I'm still reading books. I get maybe six, seven magazines sent to me every month. I read nonstop. I read things and go to a machine for the first time, not knowing the machine, but knowing all the theory and having, and with my experience, I can knock it out. No problem. Mm -hmm. I did a 500, 600,000 BTU water heater two days ago. I never went to that machine in my life. The controls I knew from other, other machines, I took care of it. I had the right tools. I know how to measure things. And I also call tech support. I always call tech support because they know their machine. And if I follow their protocol and do everything their way, I cannot make a mistake because I followed their way. And if they gave me the wrong way, it's their fault, not mine, so to speak. You know, I have to be their eyes. But if they tell me the wrong thing or change the wrong part, tell me to change the wrong part, tell the customer, listen, I went through this, I went through the manufacturer. They told me to do it this way. I did it that way and it didn't really work out. Let's try this way. But what I really find to be the best thing about talking to the manufacturer is if they give you advice and you follow it and you buy their parts and you do it their way, you'll get a new machine sometimes. I've gotten people new machines all the time. Every every few months, a guy gets a new machine. If it's under warranty or not under warranty, because I'm doing it what they want to do, the manufacturer, I have that opportunity to help the customer. And it, the education that I have and following the protocol and talking to the manufacturer is all benefits to the customer. And that's the key. That 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 is huge, you know, because... I mean, I'm not, I'm not a pro like you, obviously, right? I'm learning from y'all and I love meeting more pros, hearing their stories and, and how we help out our pro community um, across the country. And uh, when, when you're talking about being a learner, that's huge because, uh, I mean, you have the internet, right? I mean, I'm always, I mean, as a video editor or someone that's trying to learn something, I will hop on YouTube and search how to do this. And so there's that source, but you saying that you call the direct tech support that's like a step all up. That is huge. All, all the time. The internet videos, I don't really watch too many. They are very reputable people. and But they have their own agenda, meaning they have a schedule of what they're going to show you. Right. It's not like you can, oh, I have this problem and I look it up. So at the same time, too, regardless, the main thing is the if you follow manufacturer's directions and you speak to the manufacturer and they have a case number for you and they file everything there that machine belongs to, so to speak it's their machine if you treat their machine with respect they'll respect you back with help with parts with a great with a warranty with a new machine with a credit to a new machine something to just to do it yourself not ask for help is it's it's you're not gonna get a new machine right and the machine's gone so you can tell oh by the way you need a new machine now the customer's out of uh, thousands of dollars for what reason because yeah. you didn't make a phone call Plus, it's always better to have more than one person think about a, a problem or a solution. You know, I feel very confident and oh, I know my stuff, but still, I lower myself down to get help from the manufacturer. And another interesting thing is because I do that, this is very interesting. I get jobs from the manufacturer. The manufacturer actually calls me and says, Mark, I have a job for you. Really? So I get charged for the manufacturer because I called him up for help. Oh, wow. Because he said, this guy actually follows my directions. I am going to give him a job. So you built you you built, you built, uh, built more of your business also on trust, on talking to the tech support who have come to know you as a credible uh, resource for them that they're like, oh, yeah, if someone calls and something happens, they'll contract you out and, and get jobs that yeah. way. That's huge. They'll call me up. They'll tell to give my number or they'll send me out. And I'm getting paid real wages. It's not like I'm doing some kind of favor for anybody. And uh, But they want somebody that follows directions, that cares about directions. And if you ask and they know that you care and they know you follow directions, they'll give you, they'll give you work. So it works out very, it works out good. It works out good for the customer because the customer is getting the right kind of, uh, you know, service. Right. And everybody's in line because yes. it's almost like, well, if they talk tech to their tech support who trust you, they're like, oh yeah, okay. So there's something. I put the phone on speaker like. when I talk to the tech support, so the customer knows that I'm following protocol, that I'm working with the tech with the manufacturer to make your machine work properly, 
that I'm not guessing, even though I, and they and they hear me on the phone talk to them, and there are many times that I know more than the guy on the phone, but it doesn't make a difference because the guy on the phone is 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 telling me what to do, and if I don't like what they tell me, I say, listen, sir, how about this? How about that? You know, we have a conversation just like anything else, but the customer sees that the engagement with with the tech support, they see that we're talking back and forth. We're not. It's not also. I'm not telling tech support tell me what to do. We're discussing the situation. The customer appreciates that that I have some knowledge, you know, and the, transpa- the customer and the transparency, yeah, the transparency, and the customer feels comfortable with with the outcome. Even if the outcome is bad, they know that you did the best because you came up with different solutions on the phone, on speaker, with tech support. So you know that's part of how to get you know good ratings from customers, how to get trust from customers, how to get repeat customers, how to how to put a new machine in if the machine's bad because they know that the machine is bad. Because they know from the manufacturer that it's bad and that if it can or can't be repaired, they know it. So you're not like, oh, you need a new machine. No, no, no. They know. It's a really, really soft sell. I'm not pushing anything. Right. You don't want to buy it, sir? No problem. The manufacturer thinks it's not, you know, it's not safe or you can't use it anymore. So it's up to you. That's all. So it works out very good. It's, it works out very good. And... Um, my whole thing is about education. My guys are, you know, online now learning during the during this uh, crisis, online getting cert- certified for certain things. I'm giving them incentives to do certain certifications. Uh, we go to class together. Where I pay them when they go to class. Uh, making the be- make, you're it. making the best use of the the, t- t- the time that you have. Right exactly, now. exactly. But to me, it's all about education. And if you know what you're doing and you're educated, you make more money. Because if you're not educated, you're guessing and you try something and I will come to a job and tell you the machine is dead. But if the guy doesn't know what he's doing, he will just do something that will not help. It'll work for two days. He kills his name and he didn't get the sale of a new machine. And I did mm-hmm. because I'll go the full course to figure out what the problem is. Right. I don't just sugarcoat it, you know. In our business, I mean, on the interviews, you don't go so technical sometimes, but when we go to a job that has a leak, like a Freon leak, you know, Freon makes the machine work, um, there's a problem. And we don't put Freon in the machine. No, no, no. <laughs> we find the problem. We don't put a Band-Aid. We do surgery. Mm-hmm. We, do, we, we find out the problem. And that is how we make money. Because putting Freon, even though it's profitable, is one thing. Are you helping the customer? Not really, because all you're doing is giving a temporary solution that can leak out in another day, another month, another week, another year. The compressor is being harmed. The whole system is being harmed. But if you tell the customer, sir, this could be $400, $300, or it could be a $1,000 job, a $2,000 job. If the customer has a choice and you feel comfortable and confident because you know what you're doing, hey, this could be $1,000. And you're not scared because you know what you're doing is, is A, it's honest, A, it's right, and A, in the long term, there's penny spending money one time, not four times or five times. End of the day, we make more money doing that because we're at one place doing the right thing, coming back twice at least to verify the situation. And the customer gains a, a, a machine that's reliable, not a machine that fails every few weeks or every few months in the summertime or whatever period it's going to be. Yeah. So having the knowledge, you're able to diagnose the machine properly and and not be scared of numbers or not be scared of anything. And my guys all have a lot of experience and um, and we're able to do that. On a con- we'll do that on a constant basis. We don't just, if we know something's wrong, we tell the customer it's wrong. And if they want to do it wrong, we tell them this is your choice, but we're not gonna you know, back it up. We, we see a problem over here, let's do it the right way. So, that's what we do, and it works out very well. And it only only did it once we had confidence. Once I had confidence, you know, I I didn't grow with one. My first guy that I had, um, we had this conversation before, wasn't sincere, wasn't honest. He stole a job from me. He did a job in a neighborhood, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, he's missing because he did a job like four houses from me. All of a sudden, my employees are missing. I'm like, huh? That was it. Told me you can go. Oh yeah, I'm he's, sure. He's I'm not, sure we'll get into that yeah. later, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my first. But after after Ron, I got more employees, more people, 
And I found that my schooling and my education was very valuable because people that had twice as much edu- uh, experience as me knew less than me because when I went to school, I paid attention. There's certain podcasts that are amazing. Uh, Brian Orr, I don't know if you heard of him. Mm-hmm. He has a, he has great podcasts. And his information is, wow, amazing. And I learned so much from him. A lot of the things that I thought, he confirmed it for me. And it helped me. And then I taught my customers, my workers, you know, my guys, the same thing. And we all, you know, on a certain level of knowledge that's very valuable to everyone. That's awesome, Mark. When you obviously have created a culture of education as a foundation and you are a learner, a reader. I hear, yes. you know, you, you hear it a lot, you know, leaders are readers. And so um, my question to you, you know, what's the what's the latest thing that you've learned in your trade that was a, a bit of a shocker for you? Yes. Uh, I'm spending more time now learning VRVs because that's the big trend today. And I still like the smaller systems or the single zone systems when it comes to big jobs if you can because i mean again i'm not an expert but the hours needed to learn these podcast these these online classes it's like 30 hours for a system wow 30 hours for a system and if something goes wrong you just can't send somebody there this guy got to know his stuff and i also understand that the tech support on those machines are rough there's not enough people knowing the system to give you tech support and i'm about giving people support so I find it difficult. I, I gave a, a, a job a price on a job just now on a, on a school, and they had a VRV system. And I told them, you know, I feel more comfortable with single zones. I'll give you twelve single zones. The price that I came up with and the, and the other gentleman came up with was like three thousand apart. I don't know if I'll get a job or not. It was actually three thousand more expensive. It's a lot more labor running twelve machines individually. But as far as anything going bad, one machine goes bad, big deal. You replace it. That whole VRV machine has a leak. Everything has a leak. Even though they tell you, yeah, 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 all these different things, um, it's way more complicated to, to, to do. And there's so many hours of training needed to learn these machines, which we're doing and getting certified for it, that a regular single zone system, a commercial grade system, is very simple to diagnose. So that's the latest thing I'm learning. Wow. Going back to... Going back to the humble beginnings, right? And yes. coming from a very a dark place in your life, as you described it, and just really fighting an uphill battle. When did you feel like things were turning for you? You see, once I started, I wasn't asking for money for my mom. I was just, just living, but that was good for me already because I wasn't getting a handout. I'm not, a, I'm not into handouts. And my mom didn't really have to give me a handout. Whatever I got, like my uncle gave me a van, I was happy with it. Even though it had all these problems, I was still happy with it. And, um, you know, I didn't see the black anymore. I saw I saw a path that I can succeed, you know. I loved what I was doing. And I don't know if I, I, I maybe I never looked back. I, I was not scared anymore. I wasn't, I had something, I had, I had already a, a, like a destiny, a, a destination. Like things were... As long as I didn't have to ask for any help, I'm I'm good. I'm good. I was always good. And I feel that this trade could bring you to that point where you don't need help from anybody else. You can, as an employee or as an employer, if you're doing everything right, you should have no problems at all in your life. You know, you're not going to be rich, let's say. Uh, you're definitely not going to be poor and you're definitely going to be having fun. And uh, it's a physical job, which I love. Uh, let's, you know, you don't, you don't need plug Haskell Pro at all, but I'll tell you, I like to do physical work more than paperwork and the Haskell Pro makes that happen to me because I can do everything from, a, from my cell phone. I don't have to have uh, office and paperwork and all that stuff. It's all there. So you as a company make me do what I like to do. Like I told you, my first my first job, they wanted me to be in the office. I don't want to be in the office. I want to work. And, you know, I have three, four crews. We have four crews. It's not like I'm a one guy, you know, but I still, I like, to, I like to be on the field. And if they can't figure something out, I'll go there and troubleshoot it. I'll call tech support up. I'll do it. But my guys are very good and very learned. But yeah, just, this is a great, I love, you know, HVAC. And um, once I wasn't 
<laughs> didn't have to ask for any money, any handouts. I was, I was, I'm good. Nice. We're growing slowly. Profit wise, we're growing slowly. We're growing slowly, but we're expanding in a positive way. We're not in any kind of debt or any kind of negative, you know, but just slow and sure. And I believe in the future. I believe in what we're doing and, uh, you know, things will be good. You know, since you brought it up, because you know, yes. I, I don't, I don't bring it up often when it comes to you know the the power of house call pro, right? I'm yes. always curious as to how you, how did you discover house call pro? I tell you what, my problem was I wasn't billing enough or billing for people. People owed me money and it wasn't happening, so I said, you know, I got to do something. So I called up places. I called up house call pro. The first person I spoke to there, I think she was way too aggressive to sell to me. I'm like, get away from me. Because I'm a soft seller. And if you push me too much, I, I like, and the person like put a gun to my head. When you put a gun to my head, I say, shoot, because I'm not afraid. You know, I'm, I'm brazen. I'm not afraid. So um, I asked for another person. I think maybe Andrew. I think Andrew still works there too. And he helped me. And I have now a woman named Andrea. So it's like kind of like, you know, it's funny. <laughs> but uh, with the names. But uh, yeah. And they helped me. I'm, you know, happy. Uh, maybe I'll get some more more uh, extras from you from this from this podcast, <laughs> but um, but the software the software is simple, could be done on a cell phone. That's the main thing. I don't need to have a girl in a computer desk and do things, and it's so simple. My guys bill everything on the spot with the customer. We don't have to like do billing. Most people pay on the spot. Just other people don't, but maybe bigger investors or big customers or big jobs, but otherwise, you know, service jobs repairs you get paid on the spot and my workers my guys do it and it's done it's simple and it's fast and it's efficient and the money comes into my account and it's great that's awesome it's awesome man it makes life it makes life a lot can focus on work not on like you know getting paid that is awesome so so was your was your name always you know mazgan air conditioning and heating repair you know, because it's interesting to me that you you have the name repair there, um, because that's the, you know I I've talked to different pros, and um, there there is like a appliance repair service, you know that that kind of name, but um, it feels like there's there's and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it it seems maybe there's some limitations to the idea of repair, the adding that name repair. Actually, there's a lot of facets to that name, a lot. My name was originally Mazgan Cooling and Heating. <clears throat> and we live in a digital world. And when you search, nobody says my cooling is not working. <laughs> <laughs> right? And your air condition is not working. So you're going to Google AC repair. So my name, Siri just talked. My name is, is not cooling, re cooling, it's air conditioning. I'll go back a little further. So when I first started, we were on Home Advisor and I would pay for leads. And whenever I did a lead, I paid like, uh, let's say 70 bucks for a re for an installation and let's say $30 for a repair. And every, everyone thinks, oh, I'm gonna make a lot of money on installations. The problem was every time I went to installation on Home Advisor, there's like five other people, three other people bidding on it. And each time it cost me so much money and it was not making any money. And the repairs, if I called right away, I got the repair. They didn't shop it around. They just wanted somebody immediately. And when I first started, I worked with a lot of investors. And investors want things cheap. And when they want things cheap, they get cheap things. <laughs> <laughs> you get what you pay for. So they get what you, Exactly. So they would call me up and, Mark, this doesn't work. I'm like, okay, let me see. They, I didn't do the work. Somebody else did the work. Right. I come there. And it was a disastrous installation. They didn't follow the installation manual. They probably never went to school, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to fix the hardest, jumpiest, worst installations. And I would have to make it work. And I got very, very good at it. And I worked, you know, like we said in the beginning, I worked till 11 o'clock at night on a daily basis, six days a week. Um, I worked later. I didn't care. I wanted to get. I wanted to get. A. I wanted to get experience. The money was money is important, but I wanted to get the experience. I wanted to know what I'm doing, and um, so I did a lot of repairs. And 
the investors gave me amazing experience because they, they hired the cheapest guys. So I was there fixing everything. And then I realized too, on Google, when you search, if you search for installation, you're going to shop with five people anyway, just like Home Advisor. But in repair, you come there. So now you come there, like you spoke before, and it's not working, and you verify the manufacturer it's not working, or you know it's not working, prove to the customer it's not working, you get the installation, and it's not being shopped because you were there. So by having the word repair, you're being called for the job. You're not being shopped for the job. Wow. You're doing the job. You're going to make money doing the job, and you might get the installation. And most of my installations are from repairs. Right, because you're, you you did a good job on the already repair. There. I'm already, you're already there. there. If something needs to be replaced, yeah, you're I'm already there. there. Like the the trust is built. Yeah, it's a very it's a very 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 strong. Uh, probably what I'm telling you right now is probably one of the most valuable uh, things you can hear in a podcast from every podcast I heard. This is probably one of the most valuable things lessons about how to get how to get jobs. Hmm. This simple thing of having your name, air conditioning, heating, repair. Wow. That's how you get, that's how you get installations. Wow. You know, um, you've talked about how you've run your company, the culture uh, that you've created to have people that gain experience and you, you invest in their education, right? And yes. you've seen these different tips and tricks that you've implemented to get to the success of your company. Um, how has the COVID-19 thing impacted business for you has it impacted your business uh you know, what are you what are you guys doing in in response to because i mean I, I all over the news is like new york you know new york is on the news when it comes to this stuff and and i'm actually interested to hear about like what the what what it's actually like there and how are you guys doing in terms of your business i've listened to podcasts the last few weeks and people say ah, ah not a big deal there is nothing going on in New York. Construction sites are closed. Right now it's, you know, April. It was March, April. I usually do some kind of installs. And I had to stop doing them. I had a big job. I had to stop it. So everything stopped. The weather in New York this winter, okay? It's the warmest winter, I think, in the world, maybe. But in New York... Well, I grew up where it was like snowing. It was snow, you know, five times a year, six times a year. There's snow on the ground for a few weeks in the wintertime. Uh, then, it, then it melts and comes back. There was not, there was never snow that I personally saw with my eyes this winter. Not one time. It snowed, I heard. I heard it snowed. I never saw it. Um, the winter was very challenging. There was no snow. <laughs> It was no, there was no 32 degree weather, like 30 degree to 15 degrees. It didn't happen this winter. It was not cold. Mm -hmm. So the machines didn't work that hard. And yeah, we had work, but it wasn't like, it wasn't busy, busy, busy. Um, thank God we do water heaters and we do like those, the, the, like the computer, the, the tankless water heaters. They're more for an AC kind of guy that knows plumbing than for a plumber. Because there's computer boards inside, you have to know how to figure it out, you have to follow directions, you have to speak to tech support, and we are very good at that. And we're able to diagnose those machines, and I'm very happy that it's part of our product mix to actually do, you know, water heaters and tankless water heaters. I mean, like I told you, I do uh, boilers, and that was mean, the combi means it's a water heater and it's a boiler in one. So we repair them, we repipe them, we... We do so much. We redo installations on those machines all the time. Um, it, it's, it's good for us. But back to Corona. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Brooklyn, that usually is congested. Like It's like you can't move. you got to wait slow. It's like 5 o'clock in the morning. There's nobody on the road. Wow. The roads are empty. Anytime you go out, it's like, huh? I'm on, I'm on the street? And what? Huh? You look outside your house. You know, I live in a house where everything is semi-attached. We have, you know, a building across the street and everything is just congested. There's nobody on the street. The street is empty. It's like five o'clock in the morning, not five o'clock in the afternoon. It's like six o'clock in the morning. It's not like six. It's like three o'clock. It's like there's nobody there. Wow. And people don't call you up because, hey, the weather, you know, 
and and B, they don't want you in their house so much. I've got the houses that wear my mask, my gloves, alcohol, um, and there's social distancing between us. But I can't tell you how to that many times. <laughs> it's really like dead slow. Yeah. And I am number one in Google uh, on the map for AC repair, heating repair, water heater repair for five years. My phone does not ring right now. It does not ring. What, what do you uh, what do you what do you think it is? It's just people don't want to see you, and the weather is very non air conditioned needed kind of situation. I think that I will be very busy, and you know I'm a positive guy. I will be very busy this um, summer because everyone's in their house, and there's. I told my my guys. We are the best in residential. In commercial, we can still learn. I have some good commercial guys, but we rock in a residential. And we're going to do a lot of residential. And I believe that because people are afraid of us, so to speak, quote unquote, you know, social distancing, that when they have a problem, they, they'll ignore it. And that the machine will, be, will break and self-destruct because they're not going to call us. And we're going to make a lot of money, God willing, because we're going to do a lot of repair. Uh, uh, replacements as opposed to repairs because the people are going to put it to the ground. That's my feeling now before this, before the summer starts. But if the summer, if the winter is warm and the summer is going to be warm in New York, you cannot be in your house. It's, it's humid, like 90% humidity, 90 degrees. You cannot stay in your house and in your house would be like hundred and something degrees and humid. It's not dry air. It's really humid. Yeah. And it's, when I go home, I feel like, like I got out of the bed. In the summertime, because my house is always is always air conditioned. We never shut the air conditioner off, and it's like, ah, you know, when I work, I don't care to sweat. I don't care how much I sweat. I'm getting paid to sweat. I enjoy it. I love it. I'm doing it. I'm I'm going up five flights of stairs to go to a roof. Let me bring it on. No problem. Don't give me a helper. I'll do it myself. But uh, we should be doing well, God willing. But right now, it's dead. So, but again, I'm positive, and I'm not worried about it. And there is no need to call me because the weather is so mild. Yeah. And, but people are not going to call you up to do any kind of maintenance or anything now because it's just, they're scared. So you're, I got more water, I got more water heater calls than anything else. Not for heat because they can use a space heater. Right. Not for air conditioning because it's too cold. It's 50 degrees. People don't, people don't like their cold showers though. (laughs) That's it. Cold showers, you got to come. So I, my calls are for for that. So, you know, you, you said this earlier that you're taking the time to invest in, uh, you know, it's slow now. So you're investing yeah. in education, not just your education, but your, you know, your, your employees' education. Yes. Um, and I know that the summer is just right around the corner, as mm-hmm. you believe that things are going to be, you know, busy. And I and I hope that to be true. For us, um, I think it'll be very big because you can't yeah. live without air conditioning. Yeah. If you had it all your life, you can't. So then, how have you dealt with, you know, um, paying your employees? We are. I am. Spend, uh, spend thrift is that that's the word mm-hmm. i don't spend money and we have reserves and the reserves are just there because if there's nothing to spend it on i'm not going to spend it and uh so we have money in the, in the account we, we pay all our employees uh money you know as a loan and hopefully we get the ppp loan and we get it reimbursed if not they'll work it off i'm not worried but i don't mind giving a hand to somebody because i trust them and everyone's a mirror of someone else. Uh, when you deal with customers don't don't trust you, it's probably because the customer is not trustworthy, right? Yeah, That's yeah. the way it is. When you deal with people that don't trust you, they're not trustworthy people. And when you show people that you appreciate them and you trust them, they they give you back the same. And I'm there for my guys. They know it. I have one guy that's not getting money. I said, listen, if you need more money, let me know. I have no problem giving it to you. You know what I'm saying? We want to, you know, this is. I don't believe this is going to be over for two years. Personally, they talk about Christmas, you know, fall, winter, it's going to be worse. And so then when when is it going to end? It's going to end in a long time. So we're going to be working together. We're a family. They're not going nowhere else because there's no place to go. Everyone's suffering from this situation. And, um, you know, I invested in them and I love them. And I have a lot of respect for them. A lot of respect. It's, it's a very, very good relationship that we have between all of us. And, um, you know, I don't tolerate garbage from people. 
I don't tolerate garbage from anybody. One second. One second. I don't tolerate garbage from people. Uh, everything in life is a choice. And life is life is choices. And exercising that choice is the most important thing about it in life, is to exercise choices. You're not forced to do anything in life. It's a choice. And unfortunately, people don't realize that they have that choice. And by knowing you have a choice and exercising your choice, you have a happy life. Mm -hmm. And if you don't exercise the choices, you feel like you're forced to do something and you're going to be stressed out. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. I love my, I love my guys. I chose them. And in a sense, they chose me because anyone can leave, you know, but I try to be good to them and they're good people. And, and that's great that you have such a trustworthy team. I do have like a couple of questions in regards to your employees, but um, have you ever, number one, have, you've, you've chose these guys. Have you ever had to uh, let someone go? Yes, yes, yes. You know, I'm going to give you a whole story about stress, okay? Because when you have a relationship with somebody, it has to be a comfortable, happy relationship. It should not be a stressful relationship. We as business people or other kind of individuals think that, you know what? We're intelligent people, so we can deal with a lot of stress. We're intelligent people. We can, we can put that in the back burner. But I'll tell you that it's not true. How do I know? About two summers ago, I'm working, like I told you, I work physical. I was working on a job. I picked up a bottle of uh, nitrogen, you know, 40 pounds. I do it every day. I was on a roof. And all of a sudden, my back went out. Hmm. I couldn't move. I'm like, what the hell? I do this every day. How could this happen to me? And, you know, it's summertime, stressful time. Things are happening. And... I called my customer that I was supposed to see the next day. I said, sir, I'm going to be coming late tomorrow. I'm going to probably go to a chiropractor. My back's really killing me. He goes to me, what? A chiropractor? Hey, that's nonsense. You got to read my book. I'm like, what are you talking about? Come read my book. You'll see. Okay. I go to chiropractor. Back still hurts. Go to his house. And to make a long story short, I took something apart that was very hard to get to. And I didn't want to put it back together until I got the parts. So I needed to wet some books on top of each other to actually secure the part on, you know, in the ceiling. Uh, it was in a closet with a bookshelf and the part, you know, so I just had to secure it. In the intern, there was the um, book that he spoke about. He's like, hey, yeah, this is the book, take it. So I read the book. And basically the book changed my life. One of the most influential books of my life. Uh, it basically said that if you are stressed, your body gets tense. And when your body gets tense, everyone has a different reaction. Most people have back pain. Mm -hmm. And that tenseness is going to cause you pain. That's it. And if you can get rid of that stress, you can get rid of that pain and you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, what's bothering me? Well, I have people owe me money, these investors. Which, which, uh, by the way, I don't w work really with any investors almost at all, zero, because they don't like to pay. And they're stressful. And they want it done now. And they're paying less or they're paying, you know, like, come on. So I got rid of them. I got money from them. The main thing is I got money. I got like 20 grand in like a week. That made me feel good. I, I felt the stress come off. And then I said to myself, you know, I have these employees. I have these guys asking the same question every single day. They can't grow. They can't do things. They're annoying. They need a lot of attention. They're always on me. I'm like, let me get rid of them. So I got rid of one. I got rid of another. All of a sudden now. I have, I work, and then I had, I had customers that used to drive me crazy. They used to call me all the time, ah, ah, ah. the old machine, what do you want me to do, right? It needs, it needs work. Commercial machine that's old, needs work. It needs parts of breaking, this is happening, that's happening. It wasn't installed properly. And what am I going to do, reinstall the machine? Customers want to pay for that. They want some band-aids. So basically what I did is I got rid of my bad customers. I didn't care about the money. I have faith in God. I mean, I... We didn't have that conversation, but you're a, you're a God-fearing person. I am too. And whatever he gives me, I'm grateful to. And I know that he gives me. It's not I'm getting it. He's giving it to me. I got to work for it. So I got rid of my bad customers. 
I got rid of, the, of my employees that drive me nuts. They're too annoying, ask me any questions. They're not reliable, even reliable. Got rid of them. And I got the money that owed me. And I just kept in that direction that I don't want to have stress. I have a customer that's difficult. Sorry, sir, I'm too busy. It took about a year that I realized that a year passed, an August, another August passed. And I'm saying to myself, you know what? Wow. A year just passed. My back didn't hurt me. Mm. How amazing is that? You know, you walk like in, in Brooklyn's in essence is like an island. Long Island's part of Brooklyn. And there's a few streets in New York, in Brooklyn, that if you walk either direction, you'll hit, you'll hit the water. Either you'll hit the water in towards the city, Manhattan, or you'll hit the water towards like the like where, where the airport is, Kennedy Airport, Jamaica Bay. But either case, you'll hit the water. And if you just walk in the right direction, you'll get there. And so I realized to myself, said, wow, you know what? I got rid of the stress that I thought, before I thought I was so smart, I could handle all these different scenarios. But now I realize it's so good to be stupid. It's great. You know, <laughs> ignorance, is, ignorance is bliss. I got stupid. I don't, I don't know how to deal with stupid people. I don't know how to deal with crazy people. I don't, do, I don't know how to deal with them, so I don't deal with them because I, I can't handle it. So by getting rid of all that junk in my life, I actually feel with a smile like a teenager again. Because mm. remember, as teenagers, we had no stress. Our parents took care of everything. Everything was wonderful. We were happy. Right. And when I got rid of that stress, simply just not want to deal with things I don't want to deal with, like those people and those customers, those annoying things, gone. So my employees, are, are I love them because those are the ones I chose because I have a choice. I chose my employees. I choose my customers. I choose my jobs. I choose everything. I don't like it. I don't do it. It's, it's all good. God provides and that's it. Mm. Look, everything's wonderful. I'm so <laughs> glad that you, you're talking about stress because uh, one, one of the things that can be real stressful for business owners are customers who are writing bad reviews. And I have this, this segment <laughs> that we have, man, and, uh, and it's called bad review time. And so, um, I know I, I know you, I shared this with you prior to our podcast, but I would love for you to share and read Just, one of your bad reviews. I'll tell you, a bad, read one. I'll, read one. I'll tell you on Google, a bad review is not so bad. Because they average it in in a nice way, right? I have 102 reviews, let's say, at something like that, and I have I have two spammy ones that just came up. Nonsense. I try to fight it, can't win it, but I'm, I'm a 4.7. So a 4.7 in my neighborhood in New York is good. I have a lot more reviews than most people, so I'm I'm top of the line. I'm top I'm number one. On Yelp, it's a problem because a bad review is like 15, 20 bad reviews. It's, it has so much weight. I'm a 4.0 and it does not help. And I've gotten so many positive reviews in a row. I got two yesterday, actually. I'm at, at 60 because with, with Yelp, you get one, they take it down. You get one, you take it down. They bring it up, they take it down. It's like a whole thing, but your number of the 4.0 doesn't change. When I was a 4.2, 4.4, 4.6, 4.8, 5.0, the phone didn't stop them. It is what it is. What could you do? It's just it's all about communication. I did one job, one bad review in Yelp where I did a job for somebody that the wife hired me, not the husband. And the husband wasn't happy. So I did all this extra work, all this extra due diligence, all this extra time that's valuable to me that I can charge for and made no difference. He wanted money back. He wanted this. I was like, and they didn't went wrong and give money back, but we worked to that job and that was it. And it, that was it. Um, I wish I didn't have the review on there, the bad review, because that little bit makes a difference. But it's so hard with Yelp to know what's really going on. And that's really the two platforms I get business from, Yelp and from uh, from Google. Those are the two that I work with. What's the uh, scammy one that you're talking about? Eh, just he did, Listen, I tell people too, there is there is no reviews, I believe. I know my, my thing pretty well, of the bad work. They might, we're too busy, we couldn't show up. Stuff like that does happen. I do have way more people working for me now than before. I do have a secretary answer the phone. I had one, I let her go uh, in the in the actual winter before this whole thing happened. Because again, the weather was so mild, I had to get, I couldn't afford her. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to bleed till things would change. I just said, you know what, we can't, we can't do it no more. And uh, she was great. I still love her, I still talk to her, she still talks to me. 
And uh, I hope when things change that she can come back. But um, as far as work, we don't get negative on work because we care. We go back. We do whatever has to be done. You see, I'll tell you something else It's very that people don't realize, and it's very foolish. The reason why we're good at repairs, the reason why I know what I'm doing, is because if I did the wrong job, I want to come back there and learn how to do the right way. Even if it's for free. Because you know what's going to happen? Going back to God again. God's going to smile at me and says, Mark, tomorrow, or in two hours from now, I'm going to give you the same exact job that you couldn't figure out last time. Now you're going to go to it and you're going to knock it out of the water. Bada bing, bada boom. Done. And guess what? That has happened to me so many times where I couldn't figure something out. I spent, I came back there, came back there, came back there. I got it right. Didn't charge for the, all the extra times. I got it right. The next day, the same day, same day, next day, boom, same job. Knocked it out of the water. Boom. Give me money. Next. Mm. That's it. So when you make yourself better by you giving learning and wanting to know the problem, not to ah, fuck it, this customer is annoying. Excuse my French. This customer is annoying. Ah, uh, no. Learn it. Learn what the problem was. And then you'll be a superstar. And then God's going to smile at you and give you the same exact problem the same day the next day. And you're going to knock it out of the park and you're going to make money. Wow. I was just about to ask you what your, uh, what would be one good piece of advice, but I, I feel like before we cut, cut it off, but I feel like that, that was it right that, now. Believe me, I gave you a lot of nuggets today. I gave you, I try to make this podcast like valuable to the customer, to the listener that he or she could actually um, gain something from the podcast where they can actually grow their business from those suggestions and different, you know, um, experiences I had. I personally, I'm inviting anybody who can be my mentor because I need to learn a lot more than I do know now. They, will, uh, they, they, know, they know their company name. They can Google me and they can ask for me, Mark. And I would love to be helped by somebody. Hundred percent, man. I love I love how you're a learner. You are a learner. Guy doesn't go out without a fight. And your story is a beautiful story. And I I, I believe that many will be inspired. I mean, I sure have uh, in in just a short time that we've known each other, man. So thank you, thanks so much for ha- taking the time to share your experiences, the things that you've learned over time. And I'm looking forward to having you back in the future. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode. For more information, go to housecallpro.com.